Since it was first broadcast in the early 1960s, Fireball XL5 proved to be a major hit with television audiences worldwide. In the wake of this success, a variety of merchandise and products were licensed. Everything from annuals, games, toys, and jigsaw puzzles. You could even get Dad to buy you a Fireball XL5 jet mobile, well, if you really wanted one. But standing out from the crowd were the comic strip adventures of the XL5 crew, first seen in TV comic, and then in the legendary TV21 magazine. Over the years, a number of illustrators made a significant contribution to this body of work. Artists such as Neville Main, Graham Coton, Frank Hampson, Eric Eden, Don Lawrence, Tom Kerr, and Colin Andrew. One of the most prolific of all these artists was Mike Noble. His talent captured the essence of the characters and craft in a way that few others could, delivering exciting compositions with the emphasis on action. Mike illustrated many of the Fireball XL5 strips and was a key element of their success. In fact, his work on Fireball XL5 was so definitive, it could be called a noble art. The noble art of Fireball XL5. Of course, I did this uh, XL5 strip way back in 1965, as far as I can remember. We were expected to do the artwork uh, in colour. Uh, so we had to get information about what colour the actual spaceship was, what the uniforms were like and everything else. I started in the business uh, after leaving the army. I did my national service of 18 months in the 8th Royal Tank Regiment. They let me do drawings of tanks and how to drive them. and. Uh, I got employment helping a freelance artist uh, in a studio up in London. And it was then that I first met Alan Fennell. We had a Christmas party at the studio and he'd been working for TV Comic. Uh, soon after that, uh, to my great surprise, he uh, was on the staff of the newly formed TV21 publication. I was very flattered to be asked to uh, do uh, Fireball XL5. It had already been launched in the paper, uh, but uh, I think that uh, they thought they'd like me to have a try at it. It was the first time I'd ever done a, a, <laughs> a space story strip, but the first one that I did seemed to uh, please them enough, and I was able then to carry on drawing Fireball XL5 uh, for some months to come. I've got here a publication uh, dated November the 19th, 1966. And here is a reproduction of some of my artwork for this particular story. I first received a script from uh, Angus Allen or Alan Fennell that came through the post and it described each frame in words only. So they said there will be an opening panel here and the picture of Fireball XL5 coming towards, towards us uh, from a green planet which is in the background. Second picture would be described and the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth picture would all have descriptions, what they were saying, what the situation was in these panels. And from that, I then drew in pencil each frame very carefully. It usually took me, with 15 frames, about two days to do the pencil work. Once that had been done, I then inked it in in black. I then coloured it with coloured inks. With these space skies, I used an aerograph spray, which meant that I had to mask off all these areas that I weren't going to be sprayed. Then I did the spraying, and then I stripped off 
the masking and then I colored the picture in after that. With the others, it was just a question of using the colored inks rather like a watercolor. That was the sort of method I used. I had a whole list of inks to use. In those days, it was color photogravure they were printing. It was lovely and bright, but one aspect uh, was that we must not use inks that had got any black in the pigment because this would show up on the infrared photography when it was actually produced. I made a cardinal mistake originally because with my space skies I used an indigo blue. Uh, unfortunately this had some black in it and I didn't know this at the time the first two or three space guys that were reproduced came out rather like washing up water. So they quickly told me to switch to another color, which I then used, which was Prussian blue. Uh, I had to spray it on fairly dark because I wanted to give a nice night effect. In the early days, there wasn't a great deal of reference. One was asked to look at the television program. That was the thing to do. But of course, it was a little bit difficult trying to retain all the information there. I received through the post a model of XL5. It was in not in color, it was just gray. But nevertheless, it was very good because I could look at the various angles. And this helped me with my drawings. I had some black and white photographs of the main characters, uh, front, view, side and back. But of course being puppets they were rather wooden looking and the one thing which I asked Alan about uh, was whether I should depict them rather like puppets or whether I should give them a rather more realistic aspect. And he said, well, it was up to me, but he thought that probably a more realistic approach would probably be more appropriate. So that's what I did, and it gave me a great deal more freedom. When I worked with Captain Scarlet, I was given a much more comprehensive plan of all the, it's a bit old, but of all the characters that were taking place there. Uh, all in colour, so that was an enormous help. And on the back were all the vehicles that were used in the television programme. And each artist was able to receive these references and it, it helped tremendously. This happened as well with Zero X. And I had a magazine given me uh, with various other characters. There was Lady Penelope and some of the Thunderbirds stuff in it as well. So this all helped to uh, make the strip more alive, more realistic and accurate. Not only are you asked to tell the story, to portray the characters as they appear on the television, but you've also got to make the characters act on the page. Uh, so you've got to really draw people acting out scenes because as the drama unfolds, so the expressions on people's faces do change. There's looks of surprise, there's looks of anger. Uh, all these things have to be taken into account to follow the script. Alan, of course, was the uh, editor. He was quite a pioneer in, in the way that each page was designed. Um, years ago, uh, each frame was in straight lines, deck on deck. Uh, he encouraged us to break through these barriers so that a figure would burst through onto the top deck slightly or from the side. And this was terribly useful in giving action effects some of the frames we made jagged where there was explosions taking part and again this all added 
to this new pioneering effect that we were having on the pages. Uh, I also got to know my contemporaries too who were working for the magazine. That's Ron Embleton and uh, there was uh, Frank Bellamy later on. Uh, both very competent artists who, whose work I greatly admired. Uh, it was o often the Embleton strips that I uh, gained a lot of experience from, uh, and the way he used the colour and the way he used his line. And I don't think that it was, there was anything wrong in that, because in later years I discovered that other artists in the magazine were using some of the tricks that I was employing later on as well. We had to produce two pages of artwork once a week, come hell or high water. I probably would receive the script uh, on the Monday, and uh, by the following Monday I had to have the finished artwork ready. Uh, I was at a slight advantage living in the village here. I lived near a railway station. It was a very small railway station. And I knew the porters. And I used to rush down madly on a Monday morning with my finished artwork all carefully wrapped up. I used to weigh it. The porters would then put it on the train, give it to the guard, and it would go up to London. And then within about an hour it was collected the other end by my agent who then took it along to the publishing house and that's how it worked. Uh, if there was any hold-ups on the railway, well, there was panic stations then, but normally I managed to uh, be reliable and abide by the schedules. Uh, I did find that uh, some weeks there was more work than in others, depending on the story. Uh, sometimes there'll be crowds and crowds of people, and in that case I had to work longer in the evenings. I never could extend the time I took over the overall job. During my time TV 21, I got through several titles, uh, starting of course with XL5. Uh, then I went on to Zero X, which was just a film, it wasn't a series that ran on the, uh, on the box. But uh, they made it into a series uh, in the comics, so it was rather fun to do. Great enormous machine there flying into outer space. I then did Captain Scarlet. Uh, there was a bit of a tall order at the beginning, Captain Scarlet. They wanted me to do four pages a week, and uh, I found that four colour pages was a bit beyond me, so they mercifully allowed me to do the two middle pages in black and white, and this I did for some quite some while. The, uh, Captain Scarlet also turned up on the cover of some of the TV21s. After the magazine folded, um, I, uh, fortunately I was able, with the association of Alan Fennell, uh, who became editor of the new publication Look In, which was the Junior TV Times. It was due to his uh, expertise that uh, it did so well, and uh, I was asked by him whether I would like to contribute, so I jumped at the chance, because a whole new field of television stories suddenly opened up. There was Time Slip, which story of two children um, who used to go to a deserted army camp. Uh, once they'd entered the precincts of the camp, uh, they were able to travel in time, either forwards or backwards. Look In evolved um, very successfully, and I was able to do all sorts of uh, stories that were coming up on the television. Uh, Black Beauty, uh, Follyfoot Farm, which was an actual farm up in Yorkshire, 
and then on through uh, Wurzel Gummidge and the Tomorrow people as well. And then I was uh, back in history doing Robin Hood, Robin of Sherwood. So there was a, an enormous variety of work. I took over from John Burns uh, to do Space 1999, which was another of Jerry Anderson's space stories. So I returned from the uh, stories of Black Beauty and Follyfoot Farm uh, back into space. Uh, children used to write uh, letters to the editor of the publication, um, sometimes complimentary, sometimes not, about the various articles and strips in a uh, look-in. Uh, I received a letter through the post on one occasion uh, where a small boy had taken me to task about the rear end of one of the Eagle spaceships. Now, I hadn't uh, had an opportunity of having a good look at the back of one of these vehicles. In fact, there never seemed to be anything at the back of them when I watched the television programs. But I put three engines in the back and the young lad pointed out very smartly to me that, in fact, there were four engines at the back. So they uh, kept us on the straight and narrow, and uh, I think a good job too. Mike Noble's artwork defies the test of time and will continue to be seen and enjoyed by new audiences for many years to come. His illustrations and panels were a landmark achievement in the field of comic strip art. All of which I really enjoyed doing.